Okay. So we have half, half an hour. We've got 10 minutes left now, so we're going to be a little bit fast. Um, let's start talking about applied security on containers. So the first thing we need to understand is the huge evolution that we had in the infrastructure across the years, from moving from the standardized server's deployment into the virtualization, the cloud services, and eventually uh, jumping into transforming the logic of virtualizing uh, operating system and applications on top of it into finding a way where we're going to virtualize apps and share the resources of those virtualized uh, apps or OSs instead of having uh, to uh, use full resources with full hardware virtualization. And that's containers, that's where we're stopping ourselves. That's the point where we're going to lead the talk with, uh, at the end, a little bit uh, extra about serverless, but not that much. Serverless is a way where you actually write code that interacts with inputs and outputs from uh, for resources that are actually existing in the cloud. I just have things running, and I just have code that I put to input things, many inputs, and have many different outputs. It's very good when you are already in the cloud. It's useless if you want to do it on-premises. One of the things that people forget about containers is the integration that exists between the development and the actual uh, container results. So we don't have containers today if we do not plan to integrate them within the DevOps cycle. So for us, the DevOps cycle is going to go through how do I build my applications, even if they're using existing containers, and how I'm going to present them into my organization or my customers, and how I'm going to deploy them, maintain them, and then close the loop and start again. And this is a very interesting slide to see where actually Docker, eventually this little whale here, and actually also Kubernetes, because it's the second main driver for how to orchestrate Docker, goes into the circle. I included Jenkins and GitLab just for the fact of having uh, some two elements that are included into the development cycle. So we start building, testing, releasing, and deploying. And then we operate, we monitor the status, and we go back to planning, coding, building, testing, and again, and we just keep on doing that cycle. That's continuous the integration and continuous delivery. So we don't stop uh, when we have an application like uh, the applications that you see today in your iPhone, in your Android. We don't stop uh, developing them into long cycles where we do a lot of scrum meetings and a child dev and we just start like coding and sitting and testing and delivering. What we do is we actually code, push, validate and then just construct and deliver. The security in this environment is very important because people don't actually see that this is happening in the development side and the security side is totally blind about what these people are doing. The same thing, the people in the devs are totally blind about what the security can achieve. I have always a slide about making the difference between uh, containers and virtual machines. Does everybody know what a container is? Yep, yep, good. Good? So I can move on into that one. But basically, the idea is sharing the resources. When it comes to threat intelligence, and when it comes to talk about what is important in the threat analysis, there are a few things that we need to, to take in consideration. The first thing is that we have dynamics related to changes as per the infrastructure changing, the apps being developed and deployed very fast, and the threat being more and more sophisticated. The sophistication of the threat is something that may evade you a little bit because you're not every day in that soup, in that ecosystem of threat analysis, threat intelligence. But the threats keep on changing. We don't longer talk about files, uh, simple files as attack. We talk about many things. We talk about persistence attacks. We talk about advanced malware. We talk about obfuscation. We talk about sandbox eva evasion. We talk about many different types of attacks that cannot be today considered single <laughs> threat as we know them. Even the use of, uh, if you're being a little bit aware about Deep Blue, okay? No, Blue Keep, sorry. I always keep on going on the IBM on my old times. So it's not Deep Blue, it's Blue Keep. This is one of the simplest attacks on RDP where 
the sophistication of the attack is so high based on a vulnerability on RCE that it's actually nearly impossible to know how many systems are vulnerable in the world. So we're actually, uh, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of systems exposed, but you cannot control today how many. There is not a list. The thing is that it's been weaponized like a few weeks back, and now it's ready to be used by anybody, by people like us. We can just get the tools and use them. There's a part about the customer pain, which is what people are suffering now. They're suffering from having to have extensive and complex auditing on security, which takes time and money and actually it infers a lot with their normal operations. There is a, a big problem also with people sharing resources on premises and also having them in the cloud. Could be any type of cloud, even could be uh, clouds that they are uh, public or private and they're sharing the resources that they actually have a problem about how they're going to secure those resources without impacting performance. And then they don't have people. It's a human problem. We have a process problem, we have a technology problem, and we have a people's problem. There's not enough people. We need people, we need humans in the company, we need humans in, in the process of securing the organizations, but there is not enough people. And that becomes actually uh, one of the huge uh, blockers to adopt any new technology on cyber. And especially when it comes to containers, you need people who are very versed in the backend of DevOps, containers, microservices, and security. When you're using uh, resources that are actually uh, cloud-based, whether you create the cloud yourself with any open source solution or whether you're actually uh, publishing uh, your resources into public clouds, you get to the problem of having a shared responsibility model, which means that the infrastructure that you're consuming, it does it most of the time you do not own it. So you have to use it from somebody. Else. And you're responsible for what you consume and operate in that cloud, but you're not responsible from the foundation services. As soon as the foundation services are covered by the operator, doesn't matter who they are, the rest is yours. So any traffic, any consumption, any creation, development, integration, it's all your responsibility. So you need to actually find what are going to be the tools that are going to cover all the different layers in this responsibility model. I didn't build this. This is provided by Azure and by Amazon and even by Google as a standard on how to operate in any type of cloud that you do not own. So now I need to get to my containers. I need to secure them. So what do I need to secure them when I'm looking into them? It's knowing that a container is a containerized, a, a compacted app into a platform. What do I actually and how do I actually secure them? What do I need to be looking when I'm trying to secure those containers? Um, do I need to secure the host, hosting my containers, or the apps themselves, or the images when they're built? Or do I have to look into the permissions, or the framework that I'm using, depending on what type of container framework I'm, I'm working with, or the users that I'm going to access into, or the people who are going to consume the resources? I don't know. I need to look into the whole ecosystem of my containers running, and I need to know what do I need to secure. We're going to see a few solutions behind. We have paradigms behind the security on containers. The first thing is that this is no magic. We are not actually uh, creating uh, some magic wand that we can just spin up resources. They run on an OS. And the OS is always going to be there. So we are still in the same paradigm like always. Operating system an abstraction layer, and then we have the magic of the containers, as we were speaking yesterday about <laughs> creating and destroying and the isolation. But this magic is still underlying in flesh and bone operating systems, like it was been since the beginning of time. We have also a lot of problems with the fact that um, we are sharing resources in the container ecosystem. So we have a lot of shared resources across this. So those shared resources libraries, for example, could be at some point uh, updated with vulnerable versions, which we don't know because we use so many of them, and then we end up having a lot of my containers or microservices deployed being actually vulnerable, vulnerable because of that problem. Remember that in the DevOps cycle and in the container creation framework, from a human point of view and a creator point of view, 
people that we forget that it's very important for us in cybersecurity to follow the people first and then the technology, we tend not to talk, we tend not to share, and we tend not to actually tell the people what are we doing and how we're doing it. We just say, you needed these resources, we published them for you, now go to this registry, go to this uh, depot and get the resources. But do you actually ask every time in an organization when they provide you a resource, did you vet the resources? Did you actually check the security of the resources? Did you actually qualify that they passed all compliance within the company? You assume that because you're part of the framework in that organization, that every part has done its job and its due diligence. And that's one of the big errors. And people have to trust their own people. Dog eats dog. You need to trust your own people. Otherwise, the job never ends. Every time you deliver me something, if I have to knock into your door and tell you, can you vet this again for me? We're not into a situation where we can spend hours and days and months vetting every single step. And trust is one of the problems across, sh across sharing resources. We have still all the problems from the natural uh, security issues where we still have the multi-tenancy, multi-user access to the applications, the packaging sources, as I mentioned before, vulnerabilities that they always existed. This is code, so these are just normal tools, normal libraries. We have vulnerabilities. We still have to do the AAA as per, for example, accountability. We still need to look into the network traffic. We still need to control the access with role-based access control, and so on and so on. You find all the framework, all the frameworks or any possible frameworks about, about uh, security in the world, and you can apply it. We've got another problem coming through that has been evolved, and I'm going to tell you that these problems that are coming now, there's been a long, it has taken us a long time to piece them together. They existed, as silos of information and knowledge, but it has taken us a lot of years from the cyber point of view to actually piece them together and say, for example, that we have a problem with secure coding. So now I'm going to ask a common question that I always ask in all of the rooms. Who is coding here? Who is programming here? Raise the hands. Pretty cool. Very good. More or less. Okay. Who is actually using a real tool to analyze the flows on this code? Which tool? Good. One person out of? <laughs> well, yes, but actually, if you see, one person. Which set? You can add it to your CI for free for your personal project, which I have done. This is it. But, but you see, there's you st you're checking the static code. So you in some cases, but at least it's one person across seven person who raise or eight person who raise their hand. When we have an audience of 200 people, usually it's like two people that raise their hand saying, I actually analyze my code. Secure coding is one of the big problems. Usually uh, one stupid thing about cross-site scripting and SQL injection is the fact that people don't actually write the code from scratch. They use actually libraries with pre-snippets of code that is so, is so easy. They don't even see the snippets of code. It's drag and dropping. And then when they launch the code, it's like, wow, no validations. Wow, I thought that my inputs were going to be this, and now I'm getting totally different inputs in my fields. And now I can execute different type of attacks. We have a problem also with the runtime code execution. So launch the code and see what the code how what the code is what the code is doing what the, how the code is behaving we have a problem with rasp which is protecting the application from being actually vulnerable when they are being executed that's more complex uh, problem to solve when we create solutions we create apis and when we create apis we need also to make sure that the apis are secure and again who is writing apis here that may be unknown who yep a little bit? Okay. Do you just look for security and securing your APIs? Not really. Not really. You? Yeah. Do you look for securing your APIs? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, from two people, in my statistics, that's a 50-50. That's not that bad. <laughs> but I would say that if I compare it with the median of the people developing, it's bad. It should have been 100%. Because it's so rare to find people who dev on APIs that you should be looking into securing it. So. 
Here we go also into the CI-CD pipeline, and that's where you need to put all the security. We are moving from the monolithic to the modular. So we went from old times where we were actually building SQL servers with databases, as an example, to building microsystems, microservices, sorry, in containers and running them. So we're going from monolithic to modular. And this is a problem for us because we can have a company of five people launching us 20 containers with 25 or 40 different microservices running there, even more than that. When you actually map and graph a real deployment with microservices, you can see hundreds of different elements going on. Who is going to control that? You need tools behind that. We come now to the point of when we get to the logic of how do we uh, go to create our containers, we see that the security is not innovating at the same speed that we're expecting for that environment. So security still works on threats, threat intelligence, threat analysis, threat hunting. It looks into what's the logic behind uh, a threat, but they still consider, in most of the cases, that those threats are monolithic and they exist as they existed all the time. Files, those files get launched, they create processes, the processes create activities, the activities may generate suspicious objects. Those suspicious objects will be always the same. An IP, a URL, a file hash, or a domain. We don't have anything more. And now we have added uh, some uh, features that we call them, which are the behavior, a description of the behavior. So it's part of the behavioral analysis. But at the end of the day, the threat hunting is based on identifying that. A file, an IP, file hash, an IP, a URL, and a domain. Nothing more, nothing less. You can take any huge company with all of the fuss about marketing. You can take all of the PDFs, all the presentations, all of that, put it down, it comes down to these four type of objects as potential. They may name it the way they want, but it's always the same. But they are not innovating. Coding is going super fast. People are coding faster, as uh, we see in this uh, Ubuntu. There are some demonstrations. You can, in few lines of code, launch something. It goes very fast, and we have a little control about it. Techniques of coding are coming, new ones, every time. I keep on learning about new languages coming out. Every two years, there's new languages, and people are using them. The controls that we had in, in the past, they're no longer valid for the new paradigm. So when I have a CI CD pipeline on DevOps and I need to put the security controls, it means I need to stop people from using the DevOps lifecycle so that I can analyze every single step of the process. You know how costly is that? It's ridiculous. It's impossible. It kills the word agile. You're no longer agile. So you cannot just stop every developer uh, telling them, every time you go open a library, you get a new library, you ask for something, just call us back, we check the library, and we tell you if it's good or bad. The tools that we have today for cyber, they don't actually fit the model. So we need to transform the tools or get new tools to actually fit and help the people do not feel absolutely anything when they are actually, as William said, writing, coding, and delivering. Also, we have a fast deployment uh, on coding, so the amount of results is incredible. We have a lot of insecure code. And the process of creating containerized apps is uncontrolled. When I say uncontrolled, I did not say it's not undefined. It is defined, but it's uncontrolled. Anybody who has access to the CI CD pipeline with enough resources can actually publish anything inside. And inside what you're publishing in your, let's call it, uh, between Jenkins and, Jenkins and GitLab and whatever combination you want to have, it, you can push anything you want as far as you got the permissions. You started in a project and you may end up building whatever you want there. Who is controlling it? At the moment, in probably 70% of the companies worldwide, there are no security solutions at all. The market of securing microservices, containers, and the DevOps lifecycle is in its beginnings from a market share. Go ahead. That 70% number is interesting. That is the exact number of people who never applied automatic updates on Ubuntu. <laughs> Very good match. So actually, if you take the, the, and I get these numbers from the sales point of the vendors that are actually selling commercial solutions for the CI, CD, and containers, it's still here. 
It's, it's actually, people are talking about, we got two customers at the moment, actually paying customers. A lot of people testing, but only two of them. Some people get too much pain that they don't get to the point where they can, uh, they're able actually to get a product in place. So it's, it's a lot of people doing POX, it's a lot of people putting things and so some solutions into place, but there's a little amount of people converting that into a standard practice. And obviously that from point of view, standard practice means that they're actually purchasing some security solutions to cover that aspect. We're growing the container adoption massively. This is the second problem. So people are actually not securing the containers, but everybody is getting into the container ecosystem. So big companies like Maersk or uh, BMP Paribas or Societe Generale or um, uh, another bank, don't remember the name now, another one, they're actually getting into it. So their trans the digital transformation is moving what they're actually doing into containers and microservices because it's faster, cheaper, it's easier for them to ship solutions. But when it comes to security, they're like, okay, we're gonna test it, we're gonna see, we're gonna see how it goes. But first, give us enough time to transform digitally ourselves and go from the old model to the new model. And when that's smooth, let's see how we put security in properly. And this is what I said, the security vendors, I said before, they are changing the product to actually fit the, this framework. So everybody that you will see today in the security ecosystem that has solutions maybe for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, they're now with the new solutions, retransforming them into adaptable for the container ecosystem. Some type of complex attacks, complex security issues that you may find in containers. Fork bombs. For example, get containers that create unlimited amount of processes until they try to kill the uh, resources of your host, okay? Put in an example of <coughs> Docker. All of this comes from real, actual examples. Uh, containers that are not linked, that are getting communications across. Because if we by standardized, and this is where I come, I'm sorry about that, but I have love and hate, or love and aversion for the DevOps ecosystem because Sometimes you tell them, uh, we need to talk about security, and they tell you, everything is secure. My platform is 100% secure. Our environment is 100% secure. We don't need security in Docker. Docker is secure. We don't need security in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is secure. I'm like, OK, uh, so do you pass? Do you have any working guy in your team which actually goes and checks all the firewalling top to bottom about everything that you're running? It's like. Yes, it's Jeff or Jenny, and not to say Joe and Jenny, you know, like in the movies, the unknown dads that they find. And like, okay, so what's your qualification, Jenny and Joe, about networking? It's like, well, I know IP tables, I know this, that's not enough. Do you know what's going on here? Do you know how the traffic is flowing? It's like, what's your network monitoring tool actually in the platform to tell me? If I, if I have any info here, do you know if it can get there? And that's where you stop them completely. So they don't know what's going on across. So you got plenty of people running standardized Docker platforms and standardized Kubernetes platforms without knowing how the traffic is flowing, just leaving it as is. Remember, being a perfectionist and exhaustive in security is not the common practice. It's the opposite is that people think that platforms are secure by default. Unauthorized pipe of traffic is a fact of uh, using resources to jump across them to gain access to a final target. So instead of getting to you, I jump across all of these guys to pivot my attack to the final target. So I'm behind vulnerated machines that I use to vulnerate a final machine. This is also something that you find in containers, in the standard practice, standard deployments. Rogue images. If you don't control the images that you have in your platform, which you own, how do you know if they are good or bad? So you may have images there running that you don't know that they are yours. Orphaned images. What happens when somebody cuts the umbilical cord in an image, okay, and leave it there, that you don't know that's running there, 
because you've got no monitoring. Don't tell me the existing monitoring tools on command line. I'm talking about real professional monitoring where you have visibility and you know exactly what's happening. You forget about it. I'm going to tell you a story about a client I won't name that he told me that he lost a critical management VM in an environment that was super controlled. He managed to lose a controlled VM. He managed to tell me exactly, I don't know where we, we don't have a clue where the VM is. It's somewhere in the ecosystem, but we don't know where. And it's a critical, critical, critical VM. So imagine in an ecosystem that is now for sys system administrators so complex, that you're going to take a normal sysadmin and tell him, now manage this, th this ecosystem. How do you think it's not going to lose? How, how do you want spec that person expect that person to lose resources. Rogue, pro rogue processes, again, processes that we're not expecting. The persistent volume mounts, what happens when people actually use these mounts for storage that are persistent and then put some malware, for example, some malicious code, malicious uh, files there. That's a very nice one, the cryptojacking containers host, that's beautiful. There's been some cases this year and last year where they use large amount of containers to transform them and exploit them to do crypto mining. So it's very interesting. Persistent malware infections, because of the nature of how uh, containers are built as an image, as soon as you're able to infect the static code with the right sequence of coding, it doesn't matter how many times you want to kill the container and bring it back. This is not a fresh container. This is an infected container that generates a continuous persistent attack in your environment. Especially if you don't clean the images, you won't be able. And obviously, if you don't have a solution, and that's where I come with the threat intelligence, if you don't have a solution to detect command and control callbacks, which means you are infected, and at that point, you are calling back home. Home means the, uh, the home of the bad guys. So if you don't have a way to identify that those communications are not legit, and they're going to use the same channels as any of your other services, how do you stop them? It's impossible. <coughs> When we look, and I decided to took Docker, when we look at Docker, we're going to see the different elements of how do you, what you should be looking about security in the different areas. So we got the, uh, we got the host, okay? And the host, we should be looking into checking for malware, for web reputation, for IPS, so intrusion prevention, means analyzing if you have vulnerabilities, and if you have vulnerabilities, how to protect against them. Uh, firewalling, because the basic firewall is not going to be enough. You're going to have to have a more visual, more uh, organized firewall. Uh, you're going to also check for integrity. Is a host compromised? Has a host in the file been modified or tampered with? And you also need to do, for, uh, to do a, a check for log inspection, which basically means that you're checking if the logs in the system do have al entries that may flag a malicious activity in that host. So put it in another way, if somebody vulnerates your host, your Docker host, and does some bad activity, you want to have some tags that are telling you, aha, somebody's actually trying to access this resource. It's a legitimate resource, but I'm not expecting somebody to do it. But in order to do that, you need to have a tool that helps you monitor normal activities as a potential malicious behavior. When we come to our container images, we do less than that. We can check for vulnerabilities. We can check for the integrity uh, of the code uh, statically or dynamically. We can firewall the ins and outs of the image. And we can do, as I said, uh, vulnerabilities and IPS uh, remains as the same. The IPS protects you against vulnerabilities. With vulnerabilities, analyze what vulnerabilities it has. With the IPS, I block them. When it comes to the client, OK, through the remote APIs, I can do anything that's related with access to the API, airbag, a role-based access control, or out, uh, enabling a complex authentication to stop somebody from accessing the resources. When I go to the uh, host on the other side, I can see that I can check on my daemon, which is going to be gonna my Docker engine, credentials, access control, and, and have a reputation about who can actually access this host. And when it comes to my images uh, in my image repository, I'll check for integrities, checks, static checks, or eventually vulnerability checks. The registry, where I leave my images to be downloaded by other people, I have to rely on what they do. So when you create a container and you push it into a public registry, 
and you expect that to be used by hundreds of thousands of people, uh, I mean, it's your responsibility to make sure that it's safe, but it's the responsibility to make sure that it's not compromised. Usually these organizations, they actually have a lot of tools and processes behind. Any questions behind that? No? We're going to have a session uh, pretty fast. Now, some tools. Open source tools. You don't have to pay for them. New Vector has an interesting uh, vulnerability assessment for um, the actual uh, Kubernetes nodes. So when we build our actual container ecosystem, we put one node. With I'm going to limit this session to Docker and Kubernetes. Okay, put Docker, I put Docker there, and I use Kubernetes to actually orchestrate both of them. I can put more nodes if I want to, but I, that's a natural, uh, that's a natural way of doing it. Okay, easily for an example. New Vector has a solution where I can actually check privileges and actually, for example, um, this one here uh, for the admission control policy is set to always pull images. So this one is going to be in a warning because it should not be at that configuration, at that level. The idea is that the result of this analysis matches the center of internet security, which has kind of a template that if you, you should consider this like a compliance template. So what you do is you run the tool and it gives you how compliant your implementation is. And then obviously you have to take action and do the remediation behind it. With the remediation, unfortunately, I'm not going to lie, but there is already in the internet plenty of people who automated the process with scripts. So you don't actually need to go manually yourselves one by one and doing the changes, but you can do it. So uh, the slides will be given, so you will have access to all of that. The other tool is from Aquasec. So Aquasec is uh, one of the biggest players in the market. Probably from my point of view, it's one of the, if, in, if not the biggest player, very active and very uh, community driven and community supporting. They have a tool called the Kube Bench. Maybe you heard about it. Who heard about Kube Bench? Who is you? Who is running some Kubernetes here for testing? Yeah, Kubernetes, some hands up. Kubernetes around, no? So one, two, okay, yep. So Kube Bench, you heard about it? What about you? No? So Kube Bench is a very nice tool. It does exactly the same thing as New Vector but um, just with a different uh, outputting. The output is different, but the result is the same. Again, uh, uh, if you go to their <coughs> GitHub, there's <coughs> hundreds of tools uh, to use and scripts already prepared to automate the process. Uh, there's a couple of uh, websites with uh, nice people who actually, they tell you once you output uh, the result of Kube Bench and you know what is the level of compliance that you have, just pass it to this script, and with the, when you modify the script for your own environment, it will automate all the uh, security remediation, compliance remediation more than anything else. Core OS and Claire. Doesn't sound rings a bell? All of this is open source, huh? Eh? Yep, a little bit there, indeed. So Core OS and Claire, okay. It's gonna be a stati doing a static analysis for vulnerabilities in EPSI, and Docker. So the idea is that we analyze statically. And this is very important because the dynamic analysis is, an, is a different story, okay? Static analysis is the best we can do now uh, from a, I would say, uh, from a normal implementation standpoint. Dynamic requires to get to complex tools and most of them are tools that you have to pay for. They're commercial tools. So what it's going to do is basically detect if there is something uh, malicious in the actual container and stop it from being executed. Anchor. Anchor is a very interesting one because Anchor is actually giving us an open source tool like the next one that we're going to see, which is very complete and is for free. Those, uh, those kind of solutions are very good because what they do is that while you see, I'm coding, I'm working, I'm pushing into my CI CD pipeline, okay? I put some little guy here, Jenkins. It compiles, prepares my package and the image before it's going to be pushed. 
I'm going to do an image analysis, static. I'm going to do an image inspection also. So I'm going to inspect every content of the image. What am I expecting to find in the image when I do an image inspection? What? For example, but also, what else? I'm inside the image, I'm inside the files. I'm looking into finding, for example, irregular files inside the image, files that shouldn't be there. Like, for example, uh, you know about the ACAR file, which is an anti-malware test file, by default, standardized. It's a file that is detected by everybody that serves to detect any kind of, uh, to test any kind of anti-malware solution. So if I take the image and I push the ACAR inside, Anchor is going to find that file inside and automatically it's going to stop that image from being pushed into production. I will also look, for example, into policies. I will have conditions that I will write myself in their, in their environment, which will define I don't want these type of images to be uh, pushed if they don't match a certain uh, set of policies. We can speak outside of the, of the session about that because it's a more longer conversation. But what I do is I certify that my images are perfect and clean to the extent of the capacities of the product. Remember that. One thing that you need to learn a lot in cybersecurity is to say nothing is secured to the extent of what the tool can do. Remember, no magic. We are still behind normal tools. And this is another tool that does exactly the same, but uh, it has a more, uh, it goes a little bit further because it's able to analyze, for example, for CVEs. So when I find a vulnerability, there's a library or there's some code there uh, that I'm using that has a vulnerability. I'm able to reflect the vulnerability. Let's say that I'm using uh, libvirt uh, or uh, uh, JSAP or any library for, for some activity, and he finds that he has a vulnerability. He won't allow me to continue. It will tell me, wait, there is this valid existing uh, vulnerability published. You need to fix it before this uh, image can actually be published and run in production across many other things. The workshop I'm doing in the afternoon is fully based on the open sources of this, of SysDig. So we're going to go and do plenty of uh, exercises about that for the people who actually registered or want to register. So it does not only that, but it also does a behavioral monitoring. So it detects anomalous activity. So Falco analyzes the behavior of your container, or your image, to make sure that it does not deviate from a standard behavior. So if the behavior is that it never has to communicate with a particular set of URLs apart from the URLs that I'm stating here or have a particular type of network traffic, if the container has a deviation on that type of activity, it will eventually say, no, you deviate. This is an abnormal activity, a suspicious activity. I will not allow you to actually uh, continue. And you have to build the rules, remember, Again, no magic in cybersecurity. You build the rules based on the descriptions and availabilities of the scriptors that you have with the product. But you need to create, you need to define what, is, what are your limits. I create a container that is actually connecting to Google and making searches instead of me doing the search. Uh, what I do with my application is, which is containerized, is I give it a text file with 100 URLs and it will go to Google and do the search for me. If I see that the deviation is that it tries to communicate to another type of URL, that's an abnormal activity. Anything outside the expected. But how do I know it is an abnormal activity? Because I define the policy of the normal activity, and I define the policy of the abnormal activity, of what I expect not to happen. And notary is just actually uh, to prevent uh, forging and tampering of images. So. Uh, for the, uh, one of the problems that came at some point was the, the fact that uh, when Docker and, and the first container ecosystem appeared, I'm not talking about the early past, but the actual happening, there was a problem about who controlled the uh, integrity of the images. 
Nobody could control actually if the image was good or bad. If I could get to uh, the repositories, uh, the registries, and tamper with the images, nobody will tell me they were good or bad. So the idea was to build a solution that is now used by any registry today. As you go to the update framework, okay, TUF, you will see that it's used by nearly everybody, which is based on notary. It just validates the fact that nobody can actually tamper with the images. Now, if you create your own registry, and you decide to publish your own registry outside to into the internet for people to go for it and find put images or find images, make sure that you put a solution like Notary in place, which is actually uh, making sure that there is a key exchange and there is a security exchange between the image and you and that there is no tampering within the image. So nobody's going to replace the image with that rogue image. Okay. Next and last slide. And now we can finish. What is going to be the future about container security? Honestly, we don't really know. Because it keeps on changing and shifting. And uh, the actual uh, threats in within containers is not that they never existed before. It's that they keep on growing over and over and over. And people in the security ecosystem are discovering the new threats and how the new threats are applied within the containers ecosystem. And they're trying to find the ways to fight it. So as an example, there was an interesting way to infect uh, existing images in Black Hat, in the Black Hat conference in 2017. We had a chance to see examples of real infections within containers. Last year, in 2019, we had lovely uh, crypto mining uh, infected containers in the numbers of hundreds in the same organization. So they just managed to infect them with, uh, with crypto jacking. Nobody saw nothing until the perimeter devices detected a malicious activity against what? The suspicious object of the IPs and URLs to where they were trying to actually to communicate. You see, at the end of the day, we will get reduced to the same object, IPs, URLs, domains, and file hashes. But it was impossible to detect it there. So what we need today in the open source, from the open source ecosystem is a solution that covers everything that's not yet covered, that is covered commercially, but is not covered from an open source point of view. Anti-malware, intrusion prevention against existing vulnerabilities, and web reputation. Web reputation will be IP and URL analysis and command and control analysis to prevent accesses to malicious destinations. A behavior monitoring analysis, so behavior an analysis, which is in part covered cover by Falco, but I go again, Falco is covering one part, okay? Anchor is doing another part, everybody is doing bits and pieces, but nobody is doing the whole thing as an open source, as a single block. So machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually detect what you can't actually, pr what you can actually identify by default. You feel that something is wrong, but you need a model. And this is what it exists commercially, but not in the open source. And eventually, some of the files that you find in the images, uh, some of the content that could be injected into the images, should be sent into a sandbox for analysis and finding out if it's a new threat that is impossible to detect by traditional techniques. The last bastion of defense is to put it into a sandbox and see the behavior. But for that, again, we come. there are open source solutions, but nobody plugged them together. And the reason is the uh, ecosystem of the for the containers uh, and for the microservices it started being something like this, and today is huge like this. My example is always the same. Go to the Cloud Native Foundation, download the PDF about the Cloud Native Foundation of the ecosystem. If you can print it and you want to read the names, it will take probably the space of all of you sitting here to have it properly printed and see the names. It's actually a PDF where you have to zoom inside it to see which logos from each of the different uh, areas covered by the containers of the products and the startups and the vendors and the products existing. It's incredible. It started being something small and now it's huge. OK. This is it. Some questions to take. On time, we are a little bit tight because the next talk is starting in seven minutes. So, anyone has any question? Actually, I have I have one. 
Uh, in your opinion, if you have uh, like one week to set up what you could, um, what would you choose to, to, to go first? And what is the, 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 the easiest parts uh, for the game? For the game in security, you mean? Yes. So what you what would be the, 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 the easiest to do and uh, would, uh, uh, would bring more gain to, to, to it? To from a stage. product, from a tool point of view for or from a security, from a security point of view? Yeah. The first thing I would do if I was given a uh, container ecosystem is to take the best practices of the uh, existing uh, tools. So if I have Docker, Linux and I have Kubernetes, take the best practices and apply the best practices. That would be the first. If I only had a week to do that, and that was the only task I could do, I would apply best practices, including the local basic best security best practices. The second will be to choose the next tool that was going to take me the less, least amount of time to put into place. And that would be? At the moment, I would say it would be, a, in an open source, non-paying, I will choose a mixture between Falco and Aqua. If I had money, I could pay, that would be uh, a different thing. You when you pay, the difference is that the tools unfolds into, you know, the little seed becomes a blossom of a beautiful flower. Well, this is what I'm saying. We need, we need a team, we need an effort to build something that's open source, but that covers the requirements of uh, the people without having to pay. Good. Yes. Something else. Yes. Maybe uh, when you when you speak about the oh, thanks. Forget the thing. Forget the coding. Forget the coding. Uh, so when you speak about um, the container being too sparse, do you see that can also be seen as an advantage rather than a, a liability? Because as far as malware is concerned, uh, being sparse and too different might also eventually be an advantage. Uh, when I, when I say sparse, okay, I may have mm, I, I, I may have voiced that wrongly. When I say sparse, I mean that I forgot, I omitted to say something very key. When I say that it's a sparse, it means that there are too many technologies. So uh, just for the CICD, how many environments do we have? Plenty of them, you know? I just find out about one the other day because I don't have the time to follow all of them. Travis CI, for example, you just find out about it and it was like, oh, okay, and it's used by this amount of people. What I'm trying to say is that, what, what, what did I say in one of the slides? The traditional security products and tools are having a hard time to catch up with the container and CI-CD ecosystem because the ecosystem started being something very simple, it's become too sparse and too complex, there are too many tools, and your product, your tool, does not fit into every. It's trying to put a triangle shape sometimes into a circle, it doesn't fit. So when you have a security tool, you need to actually prepare it and adapt it to every single existing player. This is where it is impossible. It is impossible to cover, uh, you know, I'm going to put an example. Aqua covers probably any orchestrator in the market, all of even Mesosphere. So it covers nearly everybody. You go to Trend Micro and it only covers Kubernetes and Helm. And they have no intention to move to something else at the moment. So when you start looking into the security players who have open source tools, or even the open source tools which doesn't belong to a security player, not every tool is able to fit every ex single existing uh, solution that is in the market. And as I said, the ecosystem is like this. So either you are, this is, this is something, a very interesting question because this is driving people away from testing new environments because they don't have the ability to put any security on it. So the, the when, they the when the security is a, is a concern and, a, and, a, and an actual requirement for compliance, they're going to look into it and they're going to be like, ah, okay, I would love to use this. It fits my needs, but you know what? We've got no tools for this, so we're going to have to use this, even if it's the least appropriate for us, but it's the one that we are going to be able to be compliant. Behind the, the usage 
behind the usage of open source tools and behind the usage of any tool that you may imagine in the world, there will always be people running, um, how would they say, uh, they will be running a business and the business will require them to be compliant. And this is the simple answer. Too sparse, too many tools. So I had, a, I had a, a couple of people coming to talk with me and they said, okay, so what do you do for Travis? And I was like, with what? With this and this, nothing. Nothing. In, in first, let me figure out what is Travis, which I guess what it is, okay? I'm guessing, but after that, nothing. In fact, without being disrespectful, I told them, who's Travis? I, I know Travis as a, the name for a guy, you know, but Travis is not something that, and then you see there's some people using it. Yes, it's gonna catch up with how many others at the same time. This is, uh, this is you, know, you know, the old uh, far west when the uh, people came there and they gave them horses and they had to run and find their fences and whatsoever and build their own little pieces of, of land. This is the same thing. Everybody's running, everybody's stopping somewhere, creating their own piece of land, like their own silo, and they're living with it. Most of them of this big picture are going to get fusion and absorbed. It's inevitable. Okay, thanks. That clears it up for me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, guys.